Good evening and welcome to the news today. Tensions between Saudi Arabia and Iran may be on the verge of exploding as Tehran accused Riyadh today of deliberately striking its embassy in Yemen. The RAW has placed Washington in a difficult position, stuck between a traditional and would-be ally. And it is causing analysts to reconsider some basic assumptions that have shaped policies towards the Middle East for decades. Eli, Eli Ochenberg, diplomatic correspondent for the news today, has more. Money makes the world go around, the world go around, the world go around. They say money makes the world go round, but what is maybe more vital than the green paper is the black gold, oil. And those whose crowns are made of black gold are none other than the Middle Eastern powers, namely the Gulf countries. The discovery of large reserves of oil in the region, first in what was then Persia in 1908 and three decades later in Saudi Arabia, is one of the most fundamental turning points in the history of the modern Middle East, maybe of the modern world. It turned out that the entire area possessed the world's largest easily accessible reserves of crude oil, a must-have commodity in the 20th century industrial world. And the Gulf monarchs not only became highly rich, but highly powerful, as well as co-opted to preserve Western hegemony over the region. And it indeed was a great success, as Western dependence on Middle Eastern oil has shaped Western foreign policy for long decades with one main objective, keeping the region stable, so the oil will flow through the lanes of transportation such as the Suez Canal. But nothing was flowing during the 1970s when two major energy crises shocked the global economy. The 1973 oil crisis began when the members of the Organization of Arab Petroleum Exporting Countries declared an oil embargo in the wake of the Arab-Israeli war, leading to a rapid and sharp increase in prices. It was followed by the 1979 oil crisis, when oil output decreased in the wake of the Iranian revolution. The goal of safeguarding the Persian Gulf and the region's oil producers has become more and more important for Washington, which introduced a much more proactive and direct foreign policy. An attempt by any outside force to gain control of the Persian Gulf region will be regarded as an assault on the vital interest of the United States of America, and such an assault will be repelled by any means necessary, including military force. But the latest swings in the troubled region challenged the long-standing Western perception of the Middle East. Nowadays, the two countries which hold one quarter of the world's oil reserves are butting heads. According to the old perception, such a conflict should have dramatically sent oil prices skyrocketing. But now, oil prices are not rising whatsoever. Why? mainly because OPEC countries have insisted on overproducing oil in recent years, triggering an unrelated oil crash in the past 18 months or so. That actually solidified our uh, agenda, making sure that the effect of any future reduction in the price of oil as we move on in the next 10, 15 years is not being felt as much as it is right now. And that's not all. Prospects even show that the current conflict might even lower the already low prices, with both sides potentially refusing to reduce oil production and driving more oil into an already oversupplied market. So was the West's basic assumption on Middle Eastern stability and oil prices completely wrong to begin with? Have years of foreign policy maneuvering been wasted? And perhaps most important of all, how will these new realizations change current diplomacy? Thank you very much, everybody. Shukran. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks for everything. Yes, and with me here in the studio is Dania Elon, former Israeli Deputy Foreign Minister. Good evening. Good evening, Lucy. Also, Eli Ochomark, diplomatic correspondent for the news today. Good evening. Good evening. And Dr. Ali Nouriza Day, Director Center of the Iranian and Arab Studies, are in Skype. <laughs> is in Skype uh, with us. Good evening. Can you hear us? To you. Oh, okay. So, uh, first of all, I wanted to say that you're here, but you're not here until you will decide to come and visit us. How do you see the new approach of, uh, let's say, United States taking towards Iran after the Iran nuclear deal and maybe abandoning the Saudi Arabia? I don't think so. I don't think uh, there is a uh, you know point of trust between Iran and United States. Look. This to America is still heard in Tehran, even in front of Saudi embassy. And there are people are talk, talking about 
the Saudi and American and Israeli conspiring and they killed, uh, they executed Sheikh Nemar because he was pro-Islamic revolution against Israel and all sort of, you know, nonsense which we hear. I, I, I told you before, I said in your program, we will not see any American Iranian rapprochement as long as Khamenei is alive. Maybe after Khamenei, yes. Rouhani wants it, Khatami wanted it, Rafsanjani wanted it. The one who doesn't allow that is Khamenei. And he said it straightforward. I am not allowing any kind of rapprochement and dialogue with the United States except within the framework of the nuclear deal. But, you know, Dr. Ali Nurizadeh, what we are seeing right now, basically the current situation, is that whether Ali Khamenei will authorize it or not, what is happening here is that Saudi Arabia understands that it's alone in the region and it needs to find new allies, maybe even Russia, to put Russia into the business, maybe to put somebody else into the business. All the Gulf countries are going after Saudi Arabia after what just happened and we are seeing that Saudi Arabia understands the situation completely in a different way no let me tell you since the nuclear deal when I talk to my Arab friends they all talking about kind of the theory of conspiracy they are talking that Americans selling us to the Iranian this is not true I mean uh, anyway I tell you the American never uh, confirm or support any kind of execution, as they don't, uh, they, they condemn it in Iran. And they cannot come forward and say, well, we are happy that Mr. Nimmer has been executed alongside for 47. But those 44 of them, they were very, very important figure of Daesh and al Qaeda. So even if the American have had their hand on them, they, they would have killed them, perhaps. But anyway, the American, the uh, mother of democracy, the American, they are very concerned about human rights, and they are saying things. This is interpreted in Saudi Arabia as American are supporting Iranian, but this is not true. The American are not supporting. The American, they like Iran. Perhaps they like Iran more than they like other uh, Arab countries, but it's, it's the interest. The interest of United States is not laid with the current regime of Iran. They know Iran is not, a, is not gonna give up Hezbollah. Hezbollah is not gonna give up their slogans of death to Israel, demolition of uh, a Jewish state, and all of this nonsense, as far as the American concern, even if President Obama love Mr. Khamenei, this love would be very short uh, period. He's gonna yes. go. <clears throat> Dr. Ali Nourizadeh, until you will come to visit us here in Israel, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Thanks a lot. So uh, let's start understanding. Well, what we are hearing from Dr. Ali Nourizadeh is basically that, uh, well, uh, the United States is not supporting Iran, but the United States is looking for some targets or some kind of a hidden strategy. And I'm asking myself, well, the oil price, it doesn't need Saudi Arabia for oil. It doesn't need Iran and maybe it needs Iran to be quiet on the nuclear deal. What the United States needs? Well, I would beg to differ with Dr. Nouri Rizadeh, although, you know, his um, comments are very important and uh, he's, he knows the, the, the region. And I agree that the United States certainly not uh, by design wants to support Iran on account of Saudi Arabia, but they do it by default. And the default is lack of leadership, lack of uh, direction. Uh, by actually getting Iran out of the hook on the nuclear uh, portfolio, they, uh, I think that Mr. Obama sees or saw Iran as part of the solution in the Middle East, not part of the problem. And this is, I think, what makes the Saudis and all the Gulf countries very much concerned. And uh, also, what we see is that the United States has lost all deterrence, I would say almost respect, because they, the Saudis would not have dared to execute um, the Ali Nimr had it been a different president with a much more forceful views because of human rights issues, but also because of the strategic issues and the explosion, I would say, potential vis-a-vis -vis Iran, which of course is 
for the United States is the worst thing that can happen at this point. So let's, uh, Ellie, try to look backwards like you uh, looked in uh, the report. What was the point that the sides started either to yeah. well, go apart or go close? Well, or there are closer. many points, obviously, in the history of the U.S. Uh, where the, its foreign policy was, uh, was uh, designed. But two major points when it comes to the, its relations with the Gulf countries. When, back then in the Nixon time, after the, uh, you know, the Vietnamese quagmire, Nixon this, uh, proclaimed the uh, Nixon doctrine, calling on uh, American allies all over the world to bear the responsibility for protecting themselves, not to be so dependent on the U.S. And paradoxically, back then, the uh, Middle Eastern allies were Iran and Saudi Arabia, and a few years later we had uh, uh, we had the Carter Doctrine, as we've heard in the uh, State of the Union uh, uh, speech uh, back in uh, the 19 in uh, 1980, where uh, uh, where Carter basically uh, uh, said that any uh, attempt to, in, uh, to of intervention in the Gulf area will be answered in a military uh, uh, response by the United States. But more than that, this uh, doctrine calls for uh, an. A, maybe uh, an exaggeration of the militarization of the Middle East. And it's not that the Middle East is not, you know, already troubled with internal conflicts, but the extra militarization that the U.S. encouraged back then definitely further deteriorated the, the existing uh, conflicts. And this is something that maybe uh, they will have to, uh, you know, to be responsible for uh, at some point uh, in the future. Yeah, responsibility. This is something that maybe all the sides lost uh, in the, the recent uh, years, especially here in the Middle East and coming from the United States. But let's, let's look to the future. And what we're seeing here when, when these two countries, when Saudi Arabia and Iran, are deciding now that they're in a, some kind of a war, inside a war that is already existing in the Middle East, in the sectarian war, in the Islam religion, this just complicates all the geopolitical situation even further than what we even thought to ourselves. Well, Lucien, we have discussed it many times. Saudi Arabia and Iran are at a war for a long time, but it was a proxy war through, uh, you know, in, in, in the theater is uh, Syria. Uh, through uh, Hezbollah and um, Revolutionary Guards on the side of Assad, fighting uh, Jabhat al-Nusra or um, some other insurgents which were backed by Saudi Arabia. And it seems like now we may even go up a notch from the proxy war into a direct um, skirmishes. And uh, why is it happening? I think it is because, again, each of the sides, for, of course, they, they have no trust uh, with the other side, but also there are a great many interests here. The Saudis do not want the Iranians to capitalize on the Vienna deal, the nuclear deal, the lifting of the sanctions, getting $150 billion uh, of the uh, frozen assets, getting back into the oil market. So what do they do? They do everything they can to lower oil prices. They have enough breathing space. They have more than two and a half trillion dollars in their sovereign funds that they can really withstand a lower prices for a long time in, in, in the hope that the Iranian economy will not pick up. The Iranians understand it and they give it back to them in the field. Danny and uh, Ellie, thank you uh, very much uh, for this. Ellie, of course, uh, you are uh, coming back to us uh, to give us a recap of the Israeli politics, which...